Namaste. So we're going through Lakshmi Tantra, and some people are overwhelmed, I guess. <laughs> so the key to understanding this is to hold it in the proper context. It's like I've only been saying this for eight years now, right? <clears throat> Uh, if you haven't watched Matrix Learning, you should, because it will help you clear up any confusions that you might have about this material. I keep saying that, but so far I don't think many people are really uh, doing it. So that's the question. When we encounter extremely philosophical, abstract, highly spiritual materials. How do we understand them? How do we grasp them? What context do we put them in? Well, I would like to make three suggestions. And the one thing, first suggestion is, you have to have a big enough context, a big enough background to fit these elaborate and extremely technical kinds of teachings. But what does that mean? <laughs> it means that your background has to be bigger than the teaching, isn't it? That you, you, you don't see anything in the teaching as being outside your comprehension. You have a big enough world conceptual background within. The, the proper word for it is an ontology. You have a big enough ontology that you can fit a teaching of any size or complexity that <clears throat> spans any length of time up to and including the whole existence of the universe and beyond. You have to have a big, big world inside your head to uh, take on these teachings and not feel overwhelmed by them. Yeah, sure, uh, she's talking about the whole universe here, right? But what is our universe? Our universe is just one out of uncountable universes, all of them slightly different, all of them created as a whole, including the time and space in which they occupy. Uh, and this is the process of creation being given in these chapters. Okay, that's one point. <laughs> Another point is, all this teaching is metaphorical in nature. What does that mean? It's not literal. I mean, on some level, on the level of God and goddess, it's literal. But we don't have access to that level. So if we try to take it literally, we run the risk of fundamentalism, thinking that, well, this is the only way this can be understood, huh? or this is, this is the only way it could be, or has to be. Um, why? Because we don't truly understand it. Fundamental is, fundamentalism is always a symptom of ignorance. Ignorance means I don't know any other explanations of the same truth. Oh, but if you've been following this channel from the beginning, you do. And that leads us to our third point. <laughs> A third way that we can approach understanding this great teaching is that it's simply another view, a different metaphor for the same process, in this case, that was discussed by the Buddha in his teaching of dependent origination, dependent arising, paticca samuppada, whatever you want to call it which is the core of Buddhism, 
or should be anyway. It's the core of Buddha's teaching. Buddhism has gone far afield now, but in its original form, the Buddha's teaching was all based around the process of dependent origination, the process of becoming. So that means from the individual's point of view, how does this process of creation look? So we can invoke the hermetic axiom, as above, so below. Meaning the same process that's used to create the, the whole universe with all of its living beings and planets and stuff and whatever. <laughs> the same process is also used in the creation of the human being. The human being is made in the image of God, says the Bible. Well, what does that mean? It means that <clears throat> the whole universe is reflected in the human form. That's why the human form is considered the pinnacle of God's creation. So, what does that mean? That means that we can observe all these processes in ourselves. Because as long as we continue to exist, it means the process of creation is still going on. Becoming is a prerequisite for being. So if we exist, if we are, if we have being, that means we've gone through a process of becoming. And we're continuing to go through that process all the time, continuously, to create the next version. Huh? And you can look at it, I mean, even on a daily basis, as you come out of sleep into waking, you know, or as you come from the egg and sperm into the womb and then out into the world, huh? or as you uh, look into how you create yourself by the process of desire and so on. Any of these ways are uh, applied methods you can use to verify this teaching in your own existence. I don't mean you're going to find literally, you know, four forms of Vishnu. <laughs> Amazing. People don't get that these are metaphors. And so they get all hung up on it. You know, there's even teachings that, you know, which form has which weapon in which hand, you know, the conch shell, the disc and so on. I mean, you know, chill out, people. <laughs> No, in the beginning of the fetus, the egg subdivides into four, right? Two at first, and then two more. And then those four also divide into four, and so on. 16, 32, 64, 128, 256. See? So this process that's described in this chapter is how, uh, you know, on one level, the fetus develops. On another level, it's how our consciousness develops in the process of continuing creation of our existence. And also, it happens to describe the process creation of the universe, because it's the same process. Creation is creation. So it can be applied at a big scale or a small scale. It can be like hundreds of billions of years in length, or it can be one day. It just depends on how we look at it. It depends on how we decode the symbolism, the metaphor, and which context we apply it to. See, this is all ontological understanding. Ontology, as I've mentioned several times on this channel, the reason I got so deep into ontology is because it's the only science that's big enough 
to give us an understanding of these big, big cosmological teachings. See, if we're going to understand, uh, let me use an example. If your car breaks down, <laughs> you need to call a tow truck, right? And they have tow trucks that come for cars, right? But if you're driving a bus and the bus breaks down, you don't call the same tow truck. You call a much bigger one that's suited for buses. And it'll pick up the whole bus and drive off with it. So in the same way, <laughs> it's a silly example, right? But in the same way, if you want to decode a science, you need a science that's more powerful than that science. See? Like a tow truck that's bigger than the car that it has to pull away. So this is ontology. Ontology is the science of meaning. Or you could say it's the science of sciences. And this science is so powerful that it's used to create sciences. So you're like, what do you do? Let's say you're a physicist in the lab and you come across some weird phenomenon, you know? <laughs> Something nobody has ever observed before. How do you describe it? There aren't any words for it, right? Or if you're a chemist and you come up with a new chemical nobody has ever made before in the lab. How do you even name it? What do you call it, you know? This is the science of ontology, how to name things and how to describe their relationship with other things that are already named. So this is actually the trivial part of ontology. The deep part of ontology is taking uh, complicated science, you know, like, for example, this Lakshmi Tantra, science of creation, or ontogeny, as it's called, and uh, decoding the meaning of its language so that it fits in some context we can use for practical application. See? If you look at it like that, it's not so bewildering. It's not so challenging that it's impossible, you know. It's just, this is the kind of science that we need to approach a, a big field of knowledge. You know, like doctors, for example, have to, have to uh, memorize and understand and be able to apply a vast amount of information because the human uh, body and the process of disease can be very complicated and deceptive even. So they have to get a good grasp of all this knowledge. But wait a minute, they already have a context. Their own bodily existence and how they feel when they get sick. <laughs> so they have a context for all this stuff. But when we come across something like Lakshmi Tantra, it's like bewildering, like, whoa, what is our context? Now, I'm very fortunate. I have been studying the Puranas, the Vedic histories, for a very long time, going back to like 1971. So for me, it's not a completely unfamiliar subject or language. I can pretty much equate what I'm reading here in Lakshmi Tantra to similar narrations in other scriptures that I studied a long time ago uh, with my Adi Guru. So when I read this, to me, it's not like so far out, you know? But I can imagine, I remember how it was when I first came in contact with this. This is like better than any science fiction. Whoa, you know? This is cool. I wasn't afraid of it. I didn't feel overwhelmed. I knew that if I just buckled down and looked up the words and studied the terminology that I'd be okay. And so will you, you know? So if you haven't watched the fifth chapter narration already, go and do that now, okay? Don't be afraid of it. 
And in the next video, we're going to put up some diagrams and stuff that will make it easier to understand, I hope. <laughs> because this Lakshmi Tantra, if you get it, is the key to not only understanding everything, but having mastery of it. In other words, you can actually become a god in your next life. You can be in control of some of this cosmic process. And the, and the way to that, the path to that, starts with being in control of your own beingness, your own process of becoming. So that's why this is so important to master. And that's why we're going to keep pressing on and presenting this whole thing in its great detail. Om Tatsa. Om Shakti Om.